Take a moment and pray with me, please. <laughs> Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath, my mouth with your message. Let all that I say and all that I do bring honor and glory, Lord, to you and to you alone. In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> so we thought about this week, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of the Bible? What's the purpose of having this? Is it, okay. Is it simply just a collection of words from God to be used to communicate maybe thoughts and ideas to us? No, it's so much more than that. It's life-changing, it's life-giving, it's dynamic. These words that are here work in us. God's word reveals who we are and also who we are not. It penetrates the core of our moral and spiritual life. <laughs> it reminds us that God's demands require decisions. We must not only listen to the word, but we also must let the word shape our lives. And it can't do that if it just sits on a shelf and collects dust. Now I'll admit, I have a lot of Bibles that are sitting on my shelf collecting dust. Mm, shame on me. No, because I can say that I have four Bibles that are on my desk that I look at every single week. <laughs> I just happen to have an abundance of Bibles. But if you have a Bible at home and it's dusty, dust it off, open it up. As Christians, we must also <clears throat> always remember that the purpose of the Bible is to call us back to God by retelling the story of salvation that culminates in life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we cheapen the Bible when we use it to promote our own agenda. St. Augustine, who was a prolific writer, who produced more than 110 works over a 30-year period, he was known as a Christian philosopher. Well, he was not always a Christian. He, he was raised in the faith by his mother, Monica, However, <clears throat> Augustine drifted from the faith. He became involved with someone out of wedlock, had a child with this person out of wedlock. He joined a cult and taught rhetoric. He moved to Carthage in Africa, and he, there he began listening to some sermons of St. Ambrose. He was surprised and he learned the nature of the messages. Augustine did believe the facts of Christianity. He simply didn't want to make the commitment required to go with that belief. So he was out in his garden one day to, to think, to just sit there and meditate. And as the story goes, he heard a child's voice saying to him, take up and read, take up and read. And he thought back and he couldn't figure out why these words were coming to him. They weren't <clears throat> words from a song he knew as a child. They just made no sense to him. But he did it. He opened his Bible and he read this verse. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties or drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity or immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was Romans 13, 13 and 14. So he told his friend about this experience he had, and the friend said, I want to try this too. And he took a book, a Bible, and he opened it, and he too started to read it. And right then and there, he decided, along with St. Augustine, to follow Jesus Christ. Now, there are many stories in the Bible of people who picked up the Bible and, and are changed forever by the words they read. Our text today tells us how, how powerful and sharp God's words are. You see, the Bible is the written word of God. His utterly unique revelation. The word of God expresses who he is, what he has done, 
and what he is doing down through world history by both judgment and salvation. God has given this word to his people as the only authoritative standard for your faith and your life. The Bible is necessary because God's people do not know how to glorify God due to their own moral corruption, as well as their subjective and culturally bound limitations. The Bible is also necessary in order that his people, knowing what God requires and their failure to do it, can learn of God's great provision of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, throughout history, God has been acting in mighty deeds on behalf of his people. And as a redemptive history, history has developed. God has spoken through human authors in human language to communicate exactly what he wants from us, how he wants us to behave, how he wants us to love each other. These divinely inspired writings have been given to his people and collected in this precious book we have to become the unified message of redemption of God's people. When we speak of the Bible being inspired, what do we mean? We mean that God, the Holy Spirit, supernaturally influenced and oversaw the writing, the writing down of these scriptures that these writings become unfallible, unfailingly reliable, and authoritative. They're a perfect guide for anyone who would trust and submit themselves. For these writings are indeed from God himself. Now many people, Christians included, are intimidated by the Bible. The text can be confusing, it can be shocking, and it's normal to struggle with scripture. In fact, the truth is we are called to struggle together with scripture so that we might better understand its wisdom. The Jewish tradition of reading scripture that, and remember this is the tradition that shaped Jesus and the disciples and Paul. It promotes um, activity and lively debate so that all community members might better understand each other and the Bible. We need not fear or avoid disagreements about how best to understand a passage of scripture. And I'm gonna repeat that. We need not fear or avoid disagreements. Everybody can have their understanding when you read scripture. And sometimes it's in that discussion that you have with each other that enlightens you. That's the beauty of Bible study. You have different people with different minds and different thoughts, and everybody puts in their, their two cents, so to speak. And it opens us up to better understanding. We can choose to embrace our roots and view disagreements in a healthy process that God will use to develop unity and consensus in the communities of faith. Wouldn't it be wonderful in all aspects of life if we would all say it's okay to disagree, it's okay to understand things differently than what you understand them or what I understand them? See, whenever we address the reliability of scripture, it is indeed important to start by remembering what the Bible is reliable for. It's reliable because it rests upon and points us to the word of God, Jesus Christ. Even though we often refer to the, Bible as God, to the Bible as God's word, it is important not to lose sight of how our tradition speaks of Jesus. Understanding Jesus as God's word also helps us better understand the writing of Hebrews when he uses the term word of God. So then the question becomes, how many times have we used scripture to prove a point or promote our own agenda? Are you using it to help you clearly see who you are and how much you need God's grace? 
when we use the Bible just to promote our own agenda, we keep it from challenging us and drawing us into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Many people will take the Bible out of context, using it to promote their own thoughts. You could probably find a singular scripture, I'm sure if you looked hard enough, that would justify just about anything you want to justify in the Bible. Here are some examples. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, all kinds of rules about what we can eat and don't eat. Right? Remember? So um, you can eat, in case you're interested, you can eat locusts or grasshoppers or crickets if you so choose. Um, animals with a divided hoof and choose the cud, such as um, you can eat, but now you can't eat a pig because the pig has the divided hoof but does not chew the cud. It's in the Bible. It's true, it's what the Bible says, so if I want to justify why I don't eat pig, I'll say, well, look at this verse right here. It tells me I can't eat a pig. I can't have pork. I can justify it if I take that scripture totally out of context. Fish, you can only eat fish that have fins and scales. And then it goes on about, you know, things that crawl on the ground and what you can eat and can't eat, but I think you get the point. But there are rules in the Bible, laws, about setting aside a tenth of all you have to give to the Lord. There's a rule that at the end of seven years, you have to cancel all debts. Wouldn't that be nice? Unless you were the one that was owed. There's a rule about freeing servants after they serve you six years and you have to let them be free. There's rules about marriage. There's rules about having two wives and whose baby is considered the firstborn and which baby gets to have the firstborn rights. There's rules about divorce. There's rules about remarrying. I think you see my point. We can justify anything if we take the Bible out of context. All of these rules and law, laws have to be taken in the whole big picture, not just one verse, and not to prove your personal agenda. There was an <clears throat> article I read that talked about the politician who said, we have to put on the full armor of God to take a stand. So he's quoting the Bible, right? we got to put on a full coat of armor. But he says that God said these words against the other political party. Okay? So he's using it to advance his own agenda. He's replaced taking a stand against the devil with taking a stand against somebody who has different political views than himself just because they're thinking differently. And he's equating the other party with Satan just because they disagree. Probably the most misused verse of the Bible comes from Exodus 21, an eye for an eye. That means we can take revenge, right? Somebody hurts me, I can hurt them back, right? It's, it says eye for an eye. No? What you have to read is the whole verse. And here's the whole verse. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury. The offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now, if we look at that in the context that it was written, it is written as a guide for the judges, not as a rule in personal relationships. It does not justify revenge. This rule made the punishment fit the crime, thereby preventing cruel and, and barbaric punishments that characterize many ancient countries. This tool is to teach and not to retaliate. As we are blessed today to celebrate a service of Holy Communion, we celebrate that we Christians, we follow the new covenant. You'll hear me say, Jesus is blood, right? The blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. 
Jesus' blood poured out for us is our new covenant. We now must follow Jesus' command. Thankfully, we don't have to memorize all the 660-some laws of the Old Testament on what we can eat and can't eat and, and all of that stuff. We have it easy. All we have to do is follow what Jesus said. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So we can't go back to the Old Testament and pick one verse that's going to justify one action you want to take and say it's okay because it's in the Bible. That was the Old Testament. That was the people of Israel. That is not us. We are under the blood of the new covenant. When we make the Bible about us and not about God, we will drive away many people. We will frighten many people from engaging in the Bible. If we can justify our bad behavior and tell them, well, God says I can do that, why would they want to come to church and follow God? The existence of the Christian community over 2,000 years after the death of Jesus speaks to the power of these stories and the wisdom contained in here. Your changed life is the greatest proof of the reliability of the Bible. The Bible is the only book containing the very words of the God who created all things, showing his creatures his perfect character, <coughs> excuse me, while also explaining his way of salvation through Jesus. The Bible is indeed the only inspired, incapable of being wrong, infallible, clear, sufficiently standard for your faith and your life. It carries absolute authority. The Bible is the greatest earthly treasure that could possibly have been placed in the hands of mankind. It is life-giving wisdom. It leads us to salvation and maturity. It is the unique source of delight and joy, the joy in Jesus Christ. Through the Bible, God addresses his saving message to each of us today. We must read it and study it obediently and diligently in communion with its living divine author with the help of the Holy Spirit. In this way, we too shall understand, serve, worship, and glorify him and him only. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll continue now with the service of Holy Communion. <laughs> So I ask you to reflect on these questions each month. Do you believe in God, the Father, the Creator, the Son, the Redeemer, and the Spirit, the Sustainer? Yes. Do you believe we are all sinners redeemed by the blood of Christ and promised the hope of the resurrection if only we try? Yes. Do you believe we can live in peace with each other knowing that we have to make the effort? that in the name of Jesus Christ, all our sins are forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen, and thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, you brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image, and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. 
When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark from the waters, saved Noah and his family, made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah lasted for forty days and forty nights, and on your holy mountain, he heard your still, small voice. And so, with your, <clears throat> with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from sin, your Spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted forty days and forty nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during the forty days, and exalted him at your right hand by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection. You gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Jesus Christ. On the night that he gave himself up for us, he took bread, and of course the first thing he did was give thanks to his father. And he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, given for you. But do this in remembrance of me. And when the meal was over, the supper was done, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks to his father. And he gave, and he shared this with his friends, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. But do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. For out your Holy Spirit, Lord, on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and juice, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world. <clears throat> until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. For your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. You. you may now partake in your communion. Thank you. 